Mixing for me is something of a dark art. I'm first and foremost a musician. I'm not a sound engineer. I don't have that skill set. When I first started playing music, that was way before the digital age, and recording music was very much an analog experience. It was also a very expensive experience because if you wanted to record in a 24 track studio, for example, you'd have a buy a roll of tape and a roll of tape costs 200 pounds and that just buys you the tape. It doesn't buy you the studio time. It doesn't buy you the engineer. The change in the landscape has been pretty incredible, to be honest. We all now have incredibly powerful and cheap computers at our disposal and tools and plugins that allow us to do anything you could do back in the analog days, pretty much in your bedroom without any cost after having bought the gear. The problem for me is, having bought the gear, I don't really know how to use it, at least to a professional level. What I have learned is a result of pretty much just muddling through, having recorded thousands of bits of music, I still have an awful lot to learn. But what I have noticed is that with every little piece of information that I do acquire, it makes a very big difference to the end result. Most of that information has come from YouTube. It's an almost limitless font of free information, and it's all there right on your fingertips whenever you get stuck. Right, let's deal with the major issues. EQ for me is a bit like swimming in the dark. As I said, I'm first and foremost a musician. And as a musician, my ears are pretty good. I've spent months and years and years transcribing music. My ears as a musician are pretty good, I think. My ears as a sound engineer are absolutely hopeless. The issue I have is that if you said to me, for example, 250 hertz, I would have absolutely no idea what that means in terms of an audio sound. I basically can't hear it in my head. A maxim I use as a musician is, for example, if you're learning a scale and you want to improvise over a scale, if you can't hear that scale in your head, or for example, you can't sing it and reproduce it that way, then you don't know it. And I feel it's the same for sound engineering. So when I have recorded something like a guitar or a vocal or anything really, and there is, it just doesn't sound right, I don't really have the ability to hone in on that sound to find any frequencies that are problematic. I just can't hear it. I end up just fishing around with the frequency knob in the hope that I can find whatever it is that's causing the issue. Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. So I'm wondering, is there any quick and efficient way of learning that skill? Answers in the description, please. One thing that I have done that has made a huge difference to my mixes is using high pass filters. So I'm basically cutting out all the low end nonsense that contributes nothing to the mix or nothing to the sound. One thing that I have done is I've created a chart for myself of all the frequencies of all the notes on a guitar neck and I kind of keep that handy and that's actually very useful if there is a note that's problematic if you know what the pitch is you can kind of tune in to the fundamental or one of the harmonics I'll put that chart in a PDF and put a link to it in the description below if you think that's something that you might find that's useful. I pretty much put a high pass filter on virtually every channel and it's, as I say, it's made a huge difference. It's really cleaned up the bottom end. The bottom end is pretty much where I have most of my issues, how to create a nice tight bottom end. I'm still working on that. Sometimes I pull it off, sometimes I don't. But getting the bottom end in a track right is one of the most important things, I think, because that's where most of the energy lies in a track. So tidying up the bottom end, really important. One thing in recent times that's been a tremendous help is the availability of quite cheap studio monitors and I find that even the cheaper ones actually produce really really good results. I've got some Yamaha 5 inches and I've got some Mackie 8 inches. I generally mix on the 5 inch Yamahas and then use the larger monitors just to see that the bottom end is doing what it's supposed to do and there's no crazy stuff going on. I've been a Cakewalk user pretty much from the very beginning and still a Cakewalk user today. In Within Cakewalk there's uh, this thing called the Pro Channel and within the Pro Channel there's this thing called the Quad Curve Equal equalizer which allows you to hone in on various different frequencies and affect the cue and the frequency. It's a standard kind of equalizer that you get in uh, doors these days. I just wish I knew how to use it more effectively. Okay, compression. Compression is a tricky task to get your head around. Most of the plugins you tend to get today tend to be emulations of classic pieces of gear like the LA2 and what have you. The issue I have is most of these classic compressors that get used in the studio, I've 
no experience of using. So I don't know really what they do and how they respond to an input. So it doesn't really help me that they are emulations of these compressors. What I need is something that's a little bit more graphic. So the compressor I tend to go to is this Waves compressor here. It's called the C1 compressor and it comes either in a mono form or a stereo form. And what it gives you is a big square and it allows you to manipulate that line to show you the threshold, the ratio and the attack time and all that stuff. So that's very helpful to me because it gives me a visual idea of what's going on with the input signal. It's also got really good metering and so that helps as well because I can see what's going on. Whereas a lot of these other compressor products, they don't, the metering's not really kind of there. So you kind of got to do it by ear, which I'm not there yet and I can't really hear what is going on basically. So this having this visual representation of the input, the gain reduction, the ratio and that kind of stuff is really, really helpful to me to quickly or not so quickly get to the result that I want. And I find this kind of really, really helpful. I know what you're all going to say. You're all going to say that, well, you really should be able to do it by ear because that's ultimately what the final product is. And you're right. It's just without that kind of metering, for me, it's kind of guesswork because I don't really understand what the compressors are doing and how they're affecting the input, as I say. Another issue is I think one thing that's absolutely critical about compressors is getting the attack and release set up correctly. I find that, as I say, a bit of a dark art. I'm not there with it yet. I'm still working on that one. So any tips that you can help me on that would be great. One thing I do like to take as much advantage of as I can is, is uh, placing things in the stereo field. If you listen to a lot of Beatles records that were recorded on four track, they're just mixed in the most bizarre way at, due to necessity because they only had four tracks available to them. So you, in some tracks, you might get all the vocals to the right and all the drums to the left. And they sound like they sound like great to listen to, but the actual stereo field is really, really peculiar in how they're mixed. I mean, that was just a limitation of the gear that we. But even modern records, like for example Van Halen, so the mixes can be all the guitars in the right, all the bass in the left, and the drums plumb in the middle. That actually sounds quite radical to me. These are terrific sounding records, but to mix, I'm not quite at a place yet where I'm prepared to be that radical with a mix. So I think the thing that I'm fighting is to avoid mono-ness where everything is like right in the middle of a mix but it's hard to get away from that and it's hard to be brave with your mix with my mix I should say another thing I find problematic is that a lot of keyboards a lot of soft synths and plugins always tend to have a stereo output and that kind of is a bit restricting really because it means that for the stereo to work properly you've really got no option but to put it plumb in the middle of the mix to get the benefit of that stereo mix but you might not necessarily want it in the center of the mix so what I find myself often doing is doing this kind of on cakewalk on each channel there's an interleave switch which monofies everything and that allows you to pan a mono signal either to the left or the right yeah still struggling with that one a little bit work to do there Another plugin that I like to use is this plugin from Waves called the S1 Stereo Imager. And it allows you to push, for example, a mono signal out to the edges of the mix. And it works wonderfully. It works very, very effectively. And I use that quite a lot when you've got something, for example, a lead instrument or a string instrument that sits right in the middle of the mix. And then you've got something in the background like the strings. And then you can push those strings to left and right. It works very effectively. I do also like doing Dark Side of the Moonish panning so you've got sounds and stuff that pan from the left to the right I know it's a little bit corny but I really like doing it I think it's I think it adds a lot to a mix makes it more interesting one plugin that has helped more than any other to improve my mixes is this is this plugin by a company called sample magic and it's called magic ab and what it allows you to do is load up a whole bunch of reference tracks in these uh, things you see down the bottom here and on the right you can see it allows you to set the levels of each track and it allows you to A, B between your track, which would be in A, and the reference track, which is in B. And that's really, really helpful to get a balance of high ends to low ends in a track. I find it really, really quite surprising when you load your tracks, how bright some tracks can be or how shallow the bass can be or how big the bass can be. And it's really, really useful to be able to compare your track to what you regard as, well, any reference track that you like. I have a folder which is loaded full of reference tracks. I tend to have quite a few film score 
reference tracks in there. I mean, the main reason I'm doing that is because when people record soundtracks for films, they're generally doing it to a very high end. So they're doing it in high end studios with high end engineers and high end producers and high end musicians and high end mastering, of course. And so the end product tends to be pretty good. I would say. One of my favourites is Gladiator because I think Gladiator is one of my favourite soundtracks, but there's a whole bunch of them. So it's really good to get them up to see what the pros are doing and what the pros make their soundtracks sound like compared to what you're doing. And then you can make adjustments in your mix to compare it with the reference track. Yeah, so that's like really useful, particularly, as I say, in getting the tonal balance right. I would highly recommend anybody getting this. I've got a bunch of reference tracks, as I say. There's a bunch of soundtracks in there, but there's other records that I find. The fidelity of those records is really high. There's a Pat Metheny album called Still Life Talking, which I think sounds amazing. I tend to do a lot of guitar stuff, so there's a couple of Larry Carlton albums I really like. There's an album called Sleepwalking or Sleepwalk. I think it's called. There's a track in there called Blues Bird, which I think sounds great. So I tend to get that one up and that whole bunch of other tracks. Magic AB, really, really useful. Okay, bus effects. These I kind of use in conjunction with Magic AB, the, the plugin that I just talked about, to adjust things like compression on the output. Generally, there's this um, Waves graphic equalizer that I tend to use to hone the EQ of a track. Compression on the output bus, I find really, really difficult. I'm amazed at a lot of commercially produced albums at how much compression there is on these tracks but they sound great. They sound really, really good. When I seem to put a lot of compression on the bus compressor, they seem to sound a bit small, and I'm not sure why that is. I really haven't got my head around that yet. So I tend to use only a very, very little amount of compression. I don't know why. It's a difficult one to, for me to get my head around, because as a, as a musician, this runs counter to a lot of my instincts, because for me, as a musician, dynamics are really, really, really good. They're a good thing in music. So when you stick a compressor on the on the master bus what you're doing is you're crushing a track and you're getting a rid of a lot of those dynamics which is kind of counterintuitive in a way but to make it sound good on I don't know radio or iPod or any of those kind of things and headphones you've actually got to do it so it's something I'm battling with and I really haven't got my head around it yet as I say for me it's totally counterintuitive because as a musician I think dynamics are really really important and are a very musical thing so crushing the life out of a track is as I say counterintuitive if you listen to an orchestra live the dynamic range is enormous it go from the quietest of the quiet to a huge volume that's music that's what music should sound like but it doesn't always sound great as a recorded medium so how you find the balance there is something I still haven't got my head around and I'm really really fighting with so I tend not to do a lot of compression I think my tracks suffer for that but I don't really know how to fix it so if you've got any ideas put something in the comments please Okay, hope you enjoyed this video. If you can offer any suggestions to me, I'll be more than grateful for any advice that you could give me so I can improve my mixes even further. What I do notice is that, as I said earlier in, the, in this video, every new thing that I learn seems to make my mixes better and better and better. It also makes me want to jump back to mixes I did years ago just to remix them to apply all this new knowledge I've learned, but I haven't got time to do that. So, um, yeah, so any help you can give. So thank you for listening and see you next time.